Well, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Heritage on this Palm Sunday. Why don't we stand as we enter into this time of praise and worship together? Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's sing together on this joyous occasion about that glorious day when he called us out of our sin and out of our shame. I was buried beneath my shame.
His crown of glory now The Savior knelt to wash our feet Now at His feet we bow
dead. <laughs> and then the Savior of the world came. He died on the cross for all of our sins. So that we could be resurrected out of the dead and are now alive because of what he did on the cross. As we step into Palm Sunday, what a joyous time it must have been to see the Savior of the world come through. And just a week later, the same people that were celebrating him were spitting in his face and were beating him. But they didn't realize that in three days, all of their sins were forgiven. So, Father, as we step into this time and step into this moment, we have to remember that the victory is already yours. And the victory is dwelling in us. And the celebration of what you've done needs to be shining through us every day, not just when we're in church. So, God, I just thank you so much for a place like Heritage to call home, that we can come and we can raise a song of praise for what you've done and sing of the resurrection and sing of just this glorious day. So God, I just pray over the rest of this service, allow Justin to just breathe life that you've given his spirit this whole week prepping for this day to just fall onto us, Jesus, as sponges just absorbing the goodness of your word and the goodness of being in your presence this morning. So I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This morning is Palm Sunday. How many of you excited for Easter next week? Woo! We got everything planned from Good Friday to an Easter egg extravaganza, Pastor Jody, and our Easter service on Sunday that we get to come together as a church and celebrate Easter together. It's something that we're very excited about um, as a congregation, as church leadership. It's going to be a great time. We encourage you to invite your friends, invite your family, co-workers, Fill this in as much as we safely possibly can, right? And we got three different service times. If you look in the bulletin, you'll find out more about that. So we've got the special song that we did this last week. We kind of introduced it to you. We're going to introduce some more of it. But before we get to that, I just kind of I told him I wouldn't make a big deal of it, so I'm going to try not to. If any of you know Zach back here, our drummer, Zach, raise your hands. Zach has been with us for about four years. And Zach's going to be here in about two more weeks. And after that, he's going to take an opportunity to kind of go help another church in Columbus. And while that makes me incredibly sad, it also makes me incredibly happy to see somebody going on and helping another church. Amen? Isn't that what we're supposed to do here at Heritage? We're supposed to, we're supposed to encourage young leaders, right? So if you see Zach in the hallway, sorry, I'm kind of losing my voice because this two service thing really kind of wears me out after a while. Uh, if you see Zach in the hallway, just give him a pat on the back or something or elbow bump to tell him, hey man, thanks for being here for the last few years. We really appreciate all that you've done. And uh, give him a round of applause if you would, please. So with that, we're going to play this song this morning. It's called The Victor's Crown. We're, going to, we're introducing the full song today so that hopefully you are familiar with it for Easter weekend next weekend, right? All right, let's go through this.
morning. Jesus fulfilled literally hundreds of prophecies during his time on earth. One of which we're going to read here shortly, Mark chapter 11, if you want to make your way there. We'll be there in just a few seconds. And what we're going to read today in Mark 11 is about today, Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday, the triumphant entry, the beginning of Holy Week. For those of us here who are Christians, these next seven days are a big deal in the life of a believer. Amen? Because if Jesus doesn't do what he does between this Sunday and next Sunday, we have no hope. We have no future. If, the resur- if his death and resurrection did not happen, we're hopeless. But we're not. Yes, he died, but yes, he's alive. And we have a lot, a lot to be thankful for this morning. All right, Mark chapter 11, first 11 verses. Ready? All right. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street tied tied at a doorway. 
As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who shouted, or and those who followed, shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This event fulfilled prophecy that was written hundreds of years prior through the prophet Zechariah. And you can find it in Zechariah 9.9. 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So let's fast forward from today, Palm Sunday, Jesus on a donkey, to Friday, Good Friday, when Jesus is on the cross. Our sermon series this month is called The King's Speech. We've been looking at what Jesus spoke while he hung on the cross. And the words we're going to look at this week is found in John chapter 19, verses 28 and 29. Once again, another example of Jesus fulfilling prophecy that was spoken centuries earlier in Psalm 69, 21. Once again, Jesus is proving to the world and saying to all of us, I am who I say that I am. I am the Messiah. I am the one that all the prophets spoke about hundreds of years ago, and I am exactly who I said that I am, and I'm going to do exactly what I said I was going to do, save the world. So verse 28, later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Now those words, I thirst or I'm thirsty, are very common to us. We probably said it several times as children and even as adults, I know, In my own life, my kids have told me that hundreds of times. I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty. And we're familiar with that need because we all thirst, right? We all need water. So we understand what it's like to need a drink. And we're usually pretty willing to respond to that kind of request because typically for us, it's pretty easy to fulfill. Just go to our faucet, get some water, there you go. But the person in the text we just read isn't one of our kids. It's the Lord Jesus himself crying out, I thirst. By the time we make it to the fifth word spoken on the cross, Jesus had been hanging there about six hours. Six hours on the cross. He'd been uh, exposed to extreme weather, um, the heat. He's been mocked, beaten, betrayed, spit upon beaten and bloody, and he's carrying the weight of the sins of the world upon his shoulders all at the same time. So that coupled with his severe loss of blood, you can you can understand why the, the human side of Jesus, why he might be thirsty, right? It was the humanity of Jesus that was thirsty, but I don't think it was for physical water. Jesus didn't need his physical thirst quenched because I mean, he created the oceans, the seas, the rivers and streams. He was the water of life. I mean, he went 40 days with no food, no water. Jesus told the Samaritan woman in John 4.14, But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus also said in John 6, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And again in John 7, he says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone who is thirsty, let anyone who is thirsty come to me 
and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. He didn't need physical water because he could have just lifted his head, opened his mouth, spoken the word, and he would have had raindrops to quench his thirst at any moment that he desired. It wasn't a physical thirst. Not so much a physical need, but a spiritual longing for us. So three important stand out, uh, three important things stand out about the thirst of Jesus we see here. Number one, Jesus was thirsty for a restored relationship with him. He was thirsty for us to be restored in relationship with him. Genesis 1.27 says that man was created in God's image and likeness and had a relationship with God. But sin robbed us of that perfect relationship when Adam and Eve disobeyed and ate the fruit in the garden. It was sin that caused the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to be destroyed. It was sin, sin that caused the flood where Noah, his family, and the animals on the ark were the only people to survive. It was sin that led King David to say in Psalm 51, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Sin had put up a barrier between us and God. That was spelled out in Romans 6.23. It says, For the wages of sin is what? Death. Sin had removed man from his former position with God, and it actually made him God's enemy. Man tried to break down this barrier with the blood of bulls and goats and doves and lambs. But guess what? Nothing but the blood of Jesus can completely remove that stain of sin. Nothing but the blood. We find Jesus in our text hanging on the cross to restore the relationship between us and him. Romans 5 says, For if while we were God's enemies... We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Those words reconcile and reconciliation simply mean that through Christ's death, those barriers were broken down between us and him. Just like Pastor Dave talked about last week. The veil in the temple, it wasn't torn from the bottom up. No, it was torn from the top down so that we now have direct access to God through Jesus himself. We are reconciled to him because of what Jesus did on the cross. Do any of you remember that day that you were reconciled to God? Yeah, I do. April 11th, 2005. April 10th, 2005, I cried myself to sleep, a hopeless drunk, completely broken, miserable, empty. But when I woke up on the 11th, made my way down to Lancaster, Ohio, to my grandparents' house, I sat on their couch in their living room, Grandma on this side and Grandpa on this side. And ask Jesus to restore that relationship that I didn't have. And let me tell you what. It was the best decision I ever made. Nothing that I did or could have done. It was all because of Jesus and what he did on the cross for me. Up until that point, I was incomplete. There was something missing in my life. And like a lot of you, I tried to fill it with everything but Jesus. I tried to fill it with alcohol, drugs, and everything that goes with that lifestyle. And I was empty. And it wasn't until that day on April 11, 2005, when I asked him to come into my heart to fill me with his presence, that I truly, for the first time in my life, felt complete. And you all know that feeling if you've been saved. 
it's only Jesus and him alone that can fill that void, that emptiness within all of us. And that's all because of what he did on the cross. He thirsted for a restored relationship with him. Number two, Jesus was thirsty <clears throat> for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew when we received the Holy Spirit, he would shine in our hearts and he would lead us into a full knowledge of God and remind us of what he said. For example, Jesus said in John 14, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. He also said in John 15, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Jesus knew the Spirit would give all believers power for service, Acts 1.8. But you will receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my, my witnesses in where? Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus also knew the Spirit would illuminate us to God's truth, John 16. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. Jesus also knew that his spirit would lead us to truly worship him. John 4, yet a time is coming and now has come when true believers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. God would send the paraclete. His Holy Spirit, because he knew the disciples and all the believers and even us today would need comfort, support, strength, and encouragement to do what he's asked us to do. In John 14, it says, this is Jesus speaking, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He desires us to be filled with his Holy Spirit. Now, after I said that prayer um, on the couch in my grandparents' house, I, I, I guess I was just so empty, so void of anything good or righteous or holy in my life. That when the Holy Spirit came in, whew, I, I don't think my feet hit the ground for a good two weeks. I just kind of floated. I mean, it was the most wonderful two weeks I'd ever experienced up until that point. Because he was in me. When there was nothing good in me up until that point, he filled me. He transformed me. He changed me from the inside out. Uh, I have a family member who kind of got on my nerves. I know none of you can relate. Um, but this family member and I, we just were kind of like blood, or not blood, oil and water. Um, after I was saved and I was filled with the Spirit and God was just doing a miraculous work in me, uh, from the inside out, I, I looked at, um, it was my grandma. I said, you know, so-and-so, they're not really all that annoying anymore. And she looked at me and smiled and said, yes, he is. <laughs> he hasn't changed, but you have. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our hearts. And I'm sure there's countless other stories. Um, Pastor Bruce had a great one. After he was saved, he went back up to the to the base up in Michigan, the Upper Peninsula, and one of his coworkers there saw him, how he was acting differently, because he was saved and now filled with the Holy Spirit. He, he, had, he had been changed. He finally stopped Pastor Bruce. What is wrong with you? And Bruce told him, it's Jesus. Jesus thirsted for us to be filled 
with the Holy Spirit because he knew what a difference it could make in each and every one of our lives. Amen? Okay, number three. <clears throat> Jesus was thirsty so that we wouldn't be. Jesus endured the thirst because he knew, as we read in Revelation 7, this is what awaits us in heaven. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Is there anybody here who is glad that Jesus endured that thirst? I sure am. So that same day, April 11, 2005, uh, Grandpa Pat <clears throat> said, Jay Bird, you need to start with the book of John. And I said, okay, Grandpa. And uh, this is the only Bible I had at the time. My mom bought it for me, I think, when I was a teenager. And it sat around and collected dust for a good decade until I was 25. And so I opened it up <clears throat> to the book of John, started reading. And it didn't stop until I was done. Um, this is called a men's devotional Bible. Every few pages it has a day of the week with a short little devotional from a... Christian author or a pastor or a theologian and an excerpt from one of their books or their sermons. And I got to John 7. And I came to this devotional called Thirsty for Righteousness. And on that day, April 11, 2005, I read through this and this was exactly, I thank God that I still remember this, but this is exactly how I felt at the time. And I cried and I cried and I cried and read it over and over and over again. And I wanted to share it with you. It's from Max Lucado. If anyone is thirsty, Jesus once said, let him come to me and drink. The mission of thirst doesn't come easy for us. False fountains pacify our cravings with sugary swallows of pleasure. But there comes a time when pleasure doesn't satisfy. There comes a dark hour in the life, in every life, when the world caves in and we are left trapped in the rubble of reality, parched and dying. Some would rather die than admit it. Others admit it and escape death. God, I need help. So the thirsty come. A ragged lot we are, bound together by broken dreams and collapsed promises. Fortunes that were never made. Families that were never built. Promises that were never kept. And we are very thirsty. Not thirsty for fame, possessions, passion, or romance. We've drunk from those pools. They are salt water in the desert. They don't quench they kill blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness righteousness that's it that's what we're thirsty for we're thirsty for a clean conscience we crave a clean slate we yearn for a fresh start we pray for a hand which will enter the dark cavern of our world and do for us the one thing we can't do for ourselves, make us right again. There might be some of you here that feel that same way. Um, this is how I felt then, exactly what I was going through. But for those of us who have maybe we've walked with Jesus for years, decades, this past year, it, it's been challenging. You know, not just the virus, but losing our pastor. Um, maybe there's some of us here who are kind of craving a fresh start, a clean.
clean slate. A day where we can say, okay, God, I'm going to look forward now to what you have for, for me and for us as a church. I don't know about you, but that's still my prayer. I'm still thirsty for righteousness. Anybody else? Do you need made right again? If that's you, the altar is going to be open. You can pray here, but you can also pray right where you're at. Would you all stand? I'm just asking whatever you feel God's leading you to do. Just come forward and pray. Pray where you're at. Just close your eyes and worship Him. I pray that you would do it now as we sing. Hear the word roaring thunder with a new future to tell for the dry season is over there is a cloud beginning to swell to the skies heavy with blessings lift your eyes offer your Jesus Christ, open the heavens, now we receive the Spirit of God. We receive your We receive We read. 
benediction. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever.